everybody hear me okay? Good. Well, uh, thank you for participating, attending this portion of the show. I'd like to try to keep it as, if you guys have questions, please feel free to raise your hand or yell them out or tell me I'm stupid, any of the above. Um, I, I hope you guys don't mind, but when my, you know, we all grew up with father figures, and my dad was really kind of strict. And when I told him that I speak once in a while in front of groups, he made sure, he asked me a question, you wear a suit and tie, don't you? And I said, not very often, but occasionally. Oh, it's, it's, it's important that you always wear a suit and tie. I said, okay. Sport coat okay? He kind of looks at me, and so I hope you guys don't mind. I'm taking the suit sport coat off too, so I'm more comfortable. Because I hate these monkey suits. So. <laughs> My dad is rolling over right now. T-shirt and jeans have been funny. I like t-shirt and jeans, but I don't want to give my dad a heart attack today. <laughs> this, this will get him mad enough as it is. But today we're going to be talking about disinfection byproducts. How many people here are familiar with what a disinfection byproduct is? Most people. Okay. How many people can name a disinfection byproduct? Anybody? Throw one out at me. Name one. There we go. We got a few out there. We got a few. Anybody ever wants to contact me? There's my contact information. Why are we concerned with disinfection byproducts? One, because we are told by the EPA, we are told by the state that we need to monitor it, right? Why else should we be concerned? Well, Studies have shown that there's an increased potential for bladder cancer. Studies have shown that there is a decrease in birth weight for young child children. And there's about, oh, I guess if you Google disinfection byproduct medical results, there's probably another 100 to 150 ongoing studies that are looking at what are some of the concerns with disinfection byproducts. Okay, technical term. What are DBPs, disinfection byproducts? It is when your disinfecting agent, whatever it may be, is in contact with different types of organics. There's naturally occurring organics, there's chemical organics, there's all kinds of different types of organics that can cause that reaction. And different disinfectants provide different disinfection byproducts. There are your TT, otherwise known as TTHMs. They're chloroform, one big word, one big word, and bromoform. 60 ppb is the limit. HAA5, those are your HAA5. They will be a test, and spelling is important. <laughs> spelling is important, so make sure you write those down. Otherwise known, bromine. Anybody ever heard of bromine? Anybody here use ozone? Well, I shouldn't have to worry about bromate if I don't use ozone, correct? Well, some studies show that's not correct, that sunlight can produce bromate in large reservoirs. Chloride, usually only have to worry about with chlorine dioxide. Anybody using chlorine dioxide in the room? Okay. Those are our regulated DBPs. The unregulated DBPs could probably fill a textbook. And those are continually being evolved and they're continued being investigated. Some, of, some people around the country have additional byproducts that they are quote unquote monitoring. Do we understand what usually monitoring means? The EPA is looking at monitoring to do what? Make additional recommendations or making additional regulations downstream. So here are some unregulated, but in certain instances, disinfection byproducts that are being monitored. Why 
why do some water sources have high DVPs and why do some water sources have low DVPs? We have seen DVPs on the river right outside here that if you go upstream or downstream that are different, vastly different. What causes that difference? The amount of what we call NOM, you will hear N-O-M, are naturally occurring matter in the source water. What are some types of NOM are naturally occurring matter in the source water? Anything? Bugs? Anybody ever know what DVPs do when there's a mayfly hatch? What about when there's an algae bloom? Disinfection byproducts usually increase. What about if there is a large fish kill? Real hot summer, low amount of oxygen, fish kill. What happens to our NOMs, which can affect our TOCs, which can affect our disinfection byproducts? They usually all go up. Temperature is a big factor with disinfection byproducts, with TOCs. Higher temperatures usually result in higher DVPs. pH, water age, type of disinfectant used, be it chloramines, be it free chlorine, be it ozone, be it chlorine dioxide, be it mixed oxidants. There's all different types that will react differently. The amount and where you are adding that disinfectant is also very important for your disinfection byproducts. And cleanliness of your system. A lot of times in older systems, older pipe, longer water age, it's all kind of interconnected. Take home message today. Disinfection byproducts, decreasing those, is not just a one-stop shop. We have to look at the entire source water to tap. What you do at the source water affects what comes out of the tap. You can make a change there, you can make a change in your water plant, and you can make changes at your distribution system that will all affect your disinfectant byproducts. Maintenance, contaminants, proper in in inspection, cleaning, all those are very important and we'll discuss. What's our number one goal? To produce the best quality water at the lowest price, right? Pretty much. When I go to Mexico, which is very infrequently as you can tell by my tan, but when I get to go to Mexico, do we drink the water there? No. <laughs> do we get to drink a lot of ice cubes? Or do we drink beer? Watch your frozen drinks, by the way. When we go in the United States, do you think twice about getting water out of a tap? You think twice. Most people don't. Has he ever been to a water plant, toured, not in the state of Minnesota. Ever toured a water plant and said, I don't know if I'll drink that water. I have. <laughs> I have. <laughs> you have. I have been in certain water plants where I couldn't believe nobody got sick. Where I couldn't believe people are still drinking the water. Why is that? Because that's not their concern. Their concern was usually, I'll give you an example. I'm not going to tell you what state this was in, but it, it, it scared me. I, I, we're doing a plant, plant tour and looking at their chlorine injection system. They were using gas chlorine. I looked at the scales just out of curiosity, and I'm like, they're zero. I'm like, what's going on with that? And the operator said, well, we only get chlorine twice a year. I said, okay. Depends on how much you use, but that doesn't sound unreasonable. Yeah, we, we, we get them before our two tests need to be taken. <laughs> <laughs> Did you drink the water? No. 
<laughs> Public trust. <laughs> Depends on where they're taking the test, too. <laughs> As we all know, water systems are dynamic. They're ever-changing. What you change at your beginning of the plant, what you change at your treatment plant, all has an effect downstream. So reduction of DBPs. What are some treatment strategies? Well, we're going to look at source water, plant optimization or redesign, chemistries, distribution system maintenance, and we'll talk a little bit about TOCs and the correlation between TOCs and disinfection byproducts, different test methods to be used. Anybody use UV254? Anybody here have on-site TOC analyzer? Anybody know what TOC is? Okay. On-site TOC analyzers are really nice if you can afford one. Um, Siemens makes them really nice unit that's not too expensive. So we need to understand where our disinfection byproducts are being formed. Okay, let's focus on the source water. How many people here have source water is a surface water? Few people. Do you know you might have disinfection byproducts coming in in your source water? How many people here still also operate or are familiar with wastewater plants? Okay. One of the main things that wastewater plants do, what, is they clean up the water and then they shoot it with a lot of chlorine usually. Now we're starting to see more and more different types of disinfection. But usually it's feeding a high organic amount, high organic loading in the wastewater, and they're feeding chlorine. Then they're dechlor so they can pass state and local regulations. What they're producing is disinfection byproducts into your source water, right? Everybody agree with that? So you could have disinfection byproducts coming in in your source water. How many people have source water protection plants? Few people? What can we do with source water to <laughs> decrease the potential, and, and I'm always going to say this, because there is not a, A plus B doesn't always equal C in this case. We're going to try to limit our exposure. We're going to try to limit the amount of problems that could occur. Are any of these guarantees? No. Easiest. And the one spot I can guarantee you that we can reduce your disinfection byproducts is what? Change your source water. Find a better source water reservoir, surface, lake. Find the most pristine lake in the country and draw your source water from it. Is that economically feasible for most plants? No. No, no not likely. How many people have different wells or different intakes for their source water? Most people have backups, right? So let's look at which one of those produces the best results. A lot of times, if you're talking surface water, you can change your intake level at certain periods of time so you can dec decrease the amount of organics that are coming into your plant. So at one part of the time, part of the winter, you might be on the bottom. As the summer rolls around, you might be on the top, or it could be switched around depending on your water source. We've also seen where they have the same reservoir or same river, but they got two sources. One might be upstream, or one might be on the other side of the river. So depending on wind direction, you can change your flow. Whichever way the wind's not blowing into you can re reduce the amount of organics that are coming into your water that way. Reduce the level of organics with, by reducing the amount of algae. Algae is organics, will cause possible disinfection byproducts. So what can we do to limit 
the amount of organics that are coming in in our source water. Copper sulfide, biological bugs, aeration, multiple, multiple different treatment options for that. Some are more effective than others, and a lot of it depends on your water source, temperature, a lot of that. Well water. Can organic TOCs be in well water? Yeah, most definitely. What can you do to limit your organic loading in a well? To have a wellhead protection, see where it's coming from. When you drill a well, make sure there's no contamination beforehand. What businesses, what manufacturing was on that site beforehand? All that takes into consideration how much organics are coming into your facility. Okay, we did the facility, we did the source water. There's a bunch of different options to treat the source water. Some are effective, some are not, but that's, that's what we can do with the source water. What can we do next step is plant level. There's a lot of different options and everyone in here has a different plant. Some people are straight filter plants, very few treatment options. Some people are once through, they don't even have a filter plant. What are my options there? Other options there are, maybe we have lime softening. What are my options there? Each one of these typical plants have different options. But I'm going to go through some of the, the more familiar ones that we've seen here in the area. One of the easiest most cost-effective solutions to lower your disinfection byproducts is to either lower your dose of disinfectant, change where your disinfectant is being injected at, or change your type of disinfectant. Three different things. Is, is, is dosage, where it's at, or what type is being used. In most cases, it is being either gas or sodium hypo. If we can move those after as much organics are removed from the water, the better. If we need to feed some to control biological activity within a filter, then the feeding is low as much as po lower as amount as possible to limit your amount of disinfections being produced can help you with those. These are some really easy ways you can look at and, and pretty cost effective in the plant. You can play around with them. So you can change your feed point. Some of the other choices for the type of primary disinfectant that we're seeing, um, some people are trying to utilize UV light. UV light, there's still some research out there that needs to be done on what exactly is occurring when that happens in a for the, the beginning aspect of it. See some people going to chlorine dioxide. Some people go into ozone generation. Some people go into chloramines because of this. But one of the ways you can do it is just change your feed point or change your location. Optimize coagulation, flocculation, determine the best chemical to reduce the amount of TOCs coming. And that's what we're trying to do. We're going to try to correlate TOCs to disinfection byproducts. Because very few, if any, can we look at doing jars and actually test for TTHMs or HAA5s. We are usually, when we run jars, we're looking for one, you know, turbidity. But then the other thing we'll look at is UV254. UV254 is used as an indicator of TOC removal. It's not a one-to-one. -one, it's not a 50-to-1. There, there, it changes depending on the source water. But what we found is it's a good indicator. It's, it's a quick, easy, fast test that anybody can do, and it's easy. Um, TOC test, when we do jars, you can use actually T TOC testing. There are a few, Siemens makes one that you could get real time TOC levels when you run jars. Else you have to send those in and, and get them back within 24, 48, 96, depends on how busy the lab is. So that's what we look for. TOC or UV254. The one product that I think I get the most people hate it is PAC. Powdered Activated Carbon. 
It is messy. It is no fun to work with. And if there's any engineers in the room today, if you design a PAC room, feet room, paint it black. <laughs> paint it black. Do not paint it white. Paint it black and nobody will ever know it's dusty. But one of the easiest and most cost-effective solutions to lower TOC a lot of times is just the feed of PAC or powdered activated carbon. The thing you need to look at is what kind of dosage do you need to run to get good coagulation, good flocculation, good settling, not overloading your filters, is look at what your dosage is. And remember, not all, are, not all carbons are the same. Look at what their iodine numbers are. Look at like what their molasses numbers are. Most of the things, most of the research indicates that high iodine numbers are better. Um, but it kind of depends on what type of organics you have. Some people will claim that molasses numbers are better. So it's, it's kind of a, take a look at both. Other plant reduction strategies. Where do we usually feed powdered activated carbon? We want to feed powdered activated carbon in as far in front of the plant as possible. PAC needs reaction time. Powdered activated carbon uses absorption technology, so they absorb the organics and they hang on to them. So they absorb the organics and they need time to be in contact with them. So you want to feed, usually you want to feed your PACs or powdered activated carbons as far in the front of the plant as possible to give it the time for absorption as necessary. Anybody have GAC, which is the granulator activated carbon within their plant? I see uh, nobody's hands, but I know there's a few plants here in, in Minnesota, I've been to a few of them, that utilize GAC. Instead of, or in addition to, either one, of your typical media, which is usually gravel on the bottom, sand, anthracite in some cases, green sand in some cases, can be topped off with what they call GAC, granular, granular activated carbon. What that does is it does the same thing as a PAC, is your powdered activated carbon, but doesn't need to be fed continuously. It will provide absorption for a period of time. The problem with that is, what is that period of time? If you have a GAC, test the iodine number frequently. What we hear too often is all of a sudden, my TOC removal rates are dropping. I can't get my TOC removal that I did when I started up the plant. Or all of a sudden they just went to heck. And then we ask, how long has your GAC been in place? Oh, it's been in place anywhere from 2 to 10, 12, 15 years. And you ask them, what, what's the iodine number? How is your GAC performing? I didn't know I was supposed to take that test. If you spend the money for GAC, trend how it's performing. So you can predict when you need to regenerate it or remove it. That's the downfall with GAC. You need to either regenerate it or replace it on a basis. Reduce dosage of secondary disinfectant. Well, what does that mean? What if I'm carrying a residual of 1.0 out in the distribution site? And at all points. Am I able to reduce the amount of chlorine being fed? Yep. So I could actually reduce the potential by reducing the amount of chlorine being fed at the secondary point. Other places we've seen is a possible raise the pH. That has helped in instances. It's just an easy raise of the pH. A lot of people around are also adding solar bees or, or different types of mixers in their storage tanks. In some of these mixers, they are actually spray bars. Spray bars that are spraying and, and, and causing a reduction. How it does that is that it reduces, TTHMs can be volatilized. So if you are aerating your finished water, which sounds kind of goofy because we're all used to aerating our, our source water, if it has iron or manganese in, if it has disinfection byproducts that have already been formed, you are able to aerate 
prior to distribution, and that aeration will cause the volatile the HA or TTH amps to volatilize. It will not usually affect your HAA fives, according to most of the research I have seen. One surprising note is there's a lot of research that says, you know, my my big concern with that always was, well, you're volatilizing the TTHMs, but are you also volatilizing your chlorine residual? You would think so. Data shows it both ways. So some data indicates that there is a large decrease in free chlorine residuals or chloramine residuals. Other data says very little. So I would always say if you do it, do a pilot study and test and see what it does in your source water. Because it makes sense to me that the chlorine would volatilize also, but it doesn't seem to be. Best alternative practices for compliance. Equipment, treatment plant is optimized. Your TOC removal is optimized. Make sure I'm still on time. And maintenance. And remember, I think my ninth grade chemistry teacher is smiling right now too. Chemistry is your friend. Daily testing. Testing is important. So stage two control strategies. Again, change your disinfectant dosage. Change where you are applying your disinfection dosage at. Some people will actually have seasonal disinfection dosages. Wintertime, they're not too concerned with. But in the summertime, when temperatures are high, water age can be an issue, they can start seeing that. Enhanced coagulation, EPA has what enhanced coagulation is. It's usually adding a lot more coagulant to try to get your TOC to drop out, enhanced softening, that type of stuff. Theory is to remove as much of the TOC as possible. So you're trying to remove as much of the organics as possible. Is that guaranteeing you success in your disinfection byproducts? Unfortunately, no. Um, studies are starting to be figure out which one of the TOCs is causing your disinfection byproducts, but we can't pinpoint it yet. Alternate disinfection methods other than, than the standard chlorine gas or, or sodium hypo. And some systems have seen a decrease by utilizing phosphates to help clean up their distribution lines. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Some plants have also seen permanganate added will help reduce their organics within the plant. Sodium or potassium permanganate. We talked about PAC. Covered basins. How does that affect? Well, it doesn't allow the sunlight to come in and produce additional algae in your, your facility. So that can help some plants. <laughs> Contact time, chlorine optimization, pH control, filters. What can we do to make sure our filters are working properly, that the filters are removing as much of the, the, the organics out as possible, and optimize turbidity removal. See that last sentence on there? That's kind of a scary little sentence. Forty-one percent increase in treatment costs to meet stage two compliance. It's a big number. So plan operations. Improve testing. Evaluate your chemicals. Evaluate your process, be it a clarifier, a sed basin, retention tanks, it all matters. Evaluation your filter, how well your filters are performing. Improve your daily monitoring and prepare and learn. You guys are all preparing to learn and I, I think it's great. One of the things that I always ask is when, when somebody says, Brian, I'm having trouble with my DVPs. I say, okay, tell me a little bit about what's going on. Where are your DP, where, where did your testing occur? Somewhere out in the system, okay. Tell me about what your system numbers are, where, where you took the sample from, okay. What are they leaving the plant? I don't know. 
Why, why should I even take that test? I'm not required to. It's not one of my 4, 8, 2, 8, 12, 16, 24 sampling locations that I need to. You know, I, why should I do it? Well, it's good information to have. Because if you're failing, in some cases, you could, I've never seen it, but there's always a first time for everything, you could technically be failing on your source water. How the heck are you going to pass if you're failing on your source water? It's impossible. Okay? What if you're failing as it leaves the plant? Your source water is not failing, but your, your plant. The minute it leaves the plant, it's failing. Are you going to be able to meet it in your distribution side? No. You're going to fail there too. Determine where you're failing at. Determine where you're seeing an increase at. You can determine your, how your plant's doing. Your water plant. Look at what your history shows. We all have turbidity history, right? We all have our free chlorine usually leaving the plant, right? It's just another data point that we can utilize to make sure we can be in compliance with stage two, and at some point, probably stage three, and probably down the line, stage four. Because as we know, what do regulations usually do? Do they get easier to, 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 to meet? Or do they get stricter and stricter and stricter, right? So predict, predict what the EPA is doing is gonna to be tough. But I can, always, I can always say that most regulations get tighter and tighter and more stringent. So the more data you have, the better the testing results are. So when you do take those testing, take a test at your source water. Take a test as it leaves the plant. Take a test as it leaves your clear well. And I, we all know how water sampling locations are monitored or, or picked in the system. But also take some samples before it goes into a tower, after it leaves a tower. Different points within your distribution side to determine where your disinfection product, byproducts are causing issues. In some instances, we'll find them all on one side of town. Okay, do we want to focus on the plant? Do we want to focus on your entire distribution side? No, let's, let's, let's narrow it down to this one little section of the system. We narrow it down, what happens? It's usually more cost effective and it's better solution for that problem. So the more data that we have, the better. Let's say that it's leaving the plant in good shape, but all of a sudden at distribution parts, we're seeing issues. Well, that's usually a maintenance issue, something to do with your treatment basins, your filtration basins, your clear well structures, your storage tanks. One problem with how the United States regulates water. We make, we make drinking water what? The source of all our fire water protection and also we usually use it for pressure control, right? So what do we have to do to our systems? We have a lot more capacity out there than we really need for drinking water. Perfect world, we probably have a drinking water system and a fire water system. Drinking water system would be quick. The water age wouldn't be weeks. It wouldn't be days. It would be hours. We would be able to respond quickly. We'd be able to put water from the plant to the tap a lot faster than what we have right now. There's a, a new water plant being built, as you probably know, in South Dakota. Right? Some of you guys might be getting water from them at some day. The plant is really low operation right now. They're still working the bugs out. They're still getting the opt optimization, the, the process. But the water age in that is unbelievable. They're not talking hours. You're not talking days. You're talking months. Their water age right now is months. It will decrease as water flow, as people get picked up, but months. So storage tanks, clean distribution, reduce organic loading. Okay, chlorine, only can be dissipated a couple different ways, right? Let's just look at a free chlorine system. Chlorine will attack any of the income. So if there's ammonia, if there's organics, it's gonna attack that. 
So there's a demand. So once that demand has been set, anything you add above and beyond that is free chlorine. That free chlorine diminishes what? Over time, right? Over aeration in some cases, or increased demand. So if we can lower the amount of time it takes from leaving the plant to tap, we are decreasing the potential for having to add more chlorine on the front end. If we have a cleaner system, we can have better chlorine residuals. We can produce, we can not have to add so much at the beginning to get some kind of residual on the, on the far end. Another quick story for you. And this didn't happen in the state of Minnesota. This was, I like to make fun of it, but it was in Iowa. Go ahead and insert all Iowa jokes right now. But uh, what we saw was, had a problem. Couldn't keep a free chlorine residual through a water tank. Yeah, elevated storage tank. I said, okay, what's it going in? It's going in at 0.5. What's it coming out at? Zero. Okay. What, how, we did testing to determine why that is. Okay. When was the last time you cleaned your tower? That elevator. Oh, it was just cleaned two years ago or a year and a half ago. I said, that's weird. Something's going on in that tower. And we started thinking. I said, the only thing we can do is drain it. You know, we, 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 we kept on trying to boost it up. We were feeding three parts going in and still getting nothing coming out. And this is what people are drinking, by the way. One thing they forgot to reinstall when they cleaned out this tower. Any guesses? The screen. Any guess what we found in that storage tank once it was drained? I'm going to say we saw probably, a, I'd say a five-gallon pail of feathers. That was about all that was left. There were some bones in there too, but it was feathers. I never thought, I have no idea how many birds flew in there, sort of passed away, you know, entered their demise. Or maybe they just wanted to go for a swim, I don't know. But I couldn't believe how much chlorine it took up. Five birds. It was going through tanks of chlorine. Where was that demand? That, that, just a little story on demand. So better overall water quality. How many people do maintenance throughout the plant? Everybody raises their hand, right? How many people have been in their clear well recently? And I, every once in a while you see a few hands go up, but that's kind of one of those neglected areas. We, we, we try to do our elevated towers on a, every, what, five-year plan? Usually every 10-year plan type of thing, take into our towers. But some of the things we don't look at is our, our clear wells, our clarifiers, our holding tanks. All that stuff affects your organic loading going into your plant. So maintenance will reduce your organic loading. Again, water quality does not stop after it leaves the plant. This is one thing that we usually see. In some cases, that's not, that's not a true slide because a lot of times we see DBPs hold steady once it leaves the plant to distribution. But if you're seeing a reduce, reduction in chlorine residual, it's going somewhere. It's either being there's a demand for it or you have a water age issue. And both of them can be solved. The problem we get into is this simultaneous compliance act. EPA says we need to feed more chlorine to make sure we have the right disinfection amounts, right? And then what does the EPA say? Feed less. So you're caught between these two things, you know, simultaneous. Which one do you want me to do? I can feed more or I can feed less. Which one is it? And one is to reduce the demand throughout the process. And we'll talk about a few ways to do that. as we talked about before, and you probably heard this before, is, is, is biofilm. Biofilm on all wetted surfaces. Nobody's ever seen any of that in their distribution side, have they? Nobody's ever seen any kind of scale or any kind of muck, or has ever had to replace any piping. Scale and corrosion. Corrosion can be a sign of water quality issues, where you, your, your water balances are such that it's acidic, that it's corrosive, that you're not feeding the right phosphate or sodium silicate, or you don't have the proper pH control. 
or it could be a factor of biological growth. What happens in biofilm is that it produces, it has to eat, and when anything eats, it has to have waste. Its waste is very, very extremely acidic. So that acidic will cause corrosion. So you, everybody's probably heard of under deposit corrosion. Pinholes, you'll see them quite often. It's, a, it's sometimes a, a sign of biofilm. Or scale. Scale will reduce different places, will reduce your pipe diameters enough that you'll actually reduce flow. And sometimes it will speed up water through there that you can cause erosion on the backside. Calcium carbonate scale. We all have seen that, the, the biological and mineral deposits forming. Most people are familiar, this slide just kind of tells you about stage two compliance. Everybody's real familiar with stage two, more testing, improved sampling, preventive maintenance and, and objections, objective of the program. What do we do now? Make sure your sampling is good. Make sure you use a reputable lab. Sometimes it's not a bad idea to send in two different samples from the same water to two different labs, just to see if you can correspond testing results. More data, the better. Know what your TOCs are made out of. Your DOCs, your POCs, your NOMs, all that stuff is important when you start designing, trying to find a solution. One thing here that I've seen, and I've seen this prior for the last year and a half to two years, and it's all because of you guys, is better communication. You know, you guys talk to different plants. You find out what they're doing. You talk to different municipalities. You talk to the rural water groups. You talk to the, all the different water groups in the country are all talking. We're starting to see more and more data come across, so that's good for everybody. Where do disinfectant byproducts accumulate? My question is, everywhere. How do we remove biofilm? How do we get a pipe clean? Easiest and most cost effective solution is flushing. How many people are on a good flushing program? How many people 10 years ago were on a good flushing program? How many people 15 years ago only flushed when they had a customer complaint? Seriously, right. 20 years ago, did they really want to do much flushing? Not really, unless somebody was complaining of red water, okay, there's a hydrant near their house, I'm going to go open it up a little bit until it runs clear. Ten years ago, well, we might do a good flushing once a year if we have time and all the college kids are back and we got enough manpower and make sure there's not a big tournament that weekend and hopefully we can get around to it. We're seeing more and more municipalities get a good flushing program and stick to it. When I ask somebody what your flushing program is, and if they don't come out and tell me and bring out a map and say, here's our plant, here's our towers, here's our hydrants, here's all our lines, I can tell you one thing, you do not have a good flushing program. Unless you know exactly where your water is coming from or going to, it's difficult to flush. So always better if you can have unilateral, unidirectional flushing, flush from the outside out, inside out. If flushing doesn't go, get, get it, the pigging the lines. I, I saw some, or some people downstairs yesterday talking about the ice picking, dry ice picking. I've seen people do better jobs of picking. All that is doing is helping remove deposits in the piping, right? Remove those deposits, what happens to your chlorine demand usually? Chlorine demand will drop. Chemical control, same type of stuff. If there's something out there that can help remove that, use it. Stage two goals, filter optimization, chemical flushing program, water turnover, and distribution. Let's talk about distribution real quick. How many people have towers that have the singular inlet and outlet? Most. How many people have a singular outlet or inlet that have been produced in the last five years? A couple people, but not very many now. Most of the new technology is there's, there, it's a two-pipe system. Or it's an adjustable one-pipe system. 
So we're going to talk about tank mixing, tank turnover, dead ends, all that. We produce for fire protection for the most part plus. So they're always oversized. They are always very difficult to get into. And they're difficult to turn over. Water age. That's always a, a big question. As water age increases in certain test studies, as water age increases, so does certain parts of the disinfection byproducts. So if we can reduce our water age, we have the potential to reduce our disinfection byproducts. We also have other issues with water age, and most importantly is a lot of times it's taste and odor. You can get some taste and odor concerns if you have long, long runs of water age. <laughs> kind of a play on words there. It's not the kind of tank turnover we want, right? Okay. Tank turnover. How many people change their levels within their stores next? How many people will lower them, change them on a daily basis? Monthly? Weekly? Good. What, what are you trying to do when you change over, you change the height? Just to change the depth. What happens is on a one pipe system, I think I got a picture of it here. There it is. On a one pipe system, a lot of times you get a stagnant area of water. You get an area that stays the constant temperature, that, that doesn't turn over. What causes issues there is that stagnant water, a lot of people refer to stratification, can lead to nitrification. Nitrification can lead to more bacteria growth. More bacteria growth can lead to more chlorine demand. More chlorine demand leads to what? More chlorine put in the system. More chlorine put into the system means more potential for disinfection byproducts. Whew. That was tough. But everything has a consequence. So if we can remove and get that water flowing, remove some of that stagnant water, we have more potential to reduce biofilm, more potential to reduce disinfection byproducts. So in a one pipe system, what we always try to recommend is vary that tank level. Drop it when you can for fire protection, make sure you have enough of that. But drop it, change the levels so you just don't have that stagnant area there for months. Because if you tested that water and if you looked at that water, you think that dead bird was gross? Sometimes I've looked in a water tower and it's like a green slime. Green slime covering the top of the tank. Why? Because there's no chlorine there, right? Because the chlorine's being exposed, get, getting used up, and it's not getting mixed, and it has a bunch of air coming in. Air is a source of your bacteria, and then it causes nitrification. So all of a sudden you have all three things above needs. You got no disinfection, you got a food source, and you've got ideal temperature and water conditions. They're just going to continue to grow and grow and grow until finally they start sloughing off in your system. Once they start sloughing off into your system, you're going to start getting complaints. My water smells. Okay, that's usually not a good thing. Or my water tastes funny. Or one of your test results are going to come back and you're going to have a hit. One of your back tea samples. One of your other samples came back as a positive. Then we start talking some big bucks and we start talking about, do I really want to get this water plant in the newspaper? Do I really want to issue a boil order? What can I do to solve this? And most of all water plant problems can be solved by just a little bit of proper maintenance and proper operation. All for one and one for all. The problem that we have is some of this costs money. People have time constraints. We all have to be in this together. The operators, the distribution. How many people have separate distribution and water plant systems? A few. How many people own, actually talk on a daily basis? Really? Wouldn't you think it would be important to have your distribution guys talking to your water plant guys? and making sure everything in the whole system is correct. Too many times have I heard 
It's not my problem. Go talk to the distribution people. Go over the distribution flat people. What do they say? Not my problem. Go talk to them. So you're stuck over here in the middle. Everybody's pointing fingers at each other. It's time for everybody to work together. That's an ugly picture of a main flushing. How many people have ever done a main flushing? How many people can believe you're drinking the water that comes out of that hydrant when you first open it? How many times have you come back and somebody's asking what you're doing and you're opening up hydrant, you know, the customer on the side, right next to his house, you know what he doesn't realize? That that's his water. What do they think? Oh, that's, that's hydrant. That's for fire protection. That's for fire water. Is that good for us usually in the water industry that he doesn't put two and two together? Yeah. Yes. You, different system. And in some countries, it is actually a different system. They are actually used gray water, which is what your wastewater comes out, gray water, and then they have a separate potable water. And gray water is used for a lot of different things. And a lot of times in certain countries where water is a very oh, expensive proposition, they don't use much potable water. It's, it's very little. Well, in the United States, I use potable water what? To water my lawn, right? I have an acre of land that I water with potable water. What do I do when I wash my car? I waste water. Some other countries are, are different about that, so it's kind of funny. Main flushing. I have been to different places where I've seen main flushing. I've seen places where they take it really seriously. They'll open up the main, got the stopwatch, see how long it takes to run clear. Then what do they do? Then they take a sample of that and run a turbidity on it. Okay, what's the turbidity? If it's good, if it's near, if it's near what the plant runs, what do they do next? They run a chlorine analysis, free chlorine on it. What does that tell them? That they're getting good water flushed through the system. How many times have I seen this? Good enough. Time to go. That or open it up. It's been 25 minutes. I can't sit here. I'm flooding the street. <laughs> I gotta shut this thing off. Is that a proper flush? No. But that's what we do. Recommend spring and fall. Unless you have an ice skating rink that you really need to flush and have a fire hydrant, then winter time's good. Sufficient water. The key there is to make sure you plan worst case scenario. Fill up your towers, have your water plant on standby. Be able to operate that plant if flushing takes longer. If I open up a, a six inch water main, and I gotta let it run for 25, 30 minutes, hour long before it runs clear, I pretty much drain that tower if I'm running at the right flow rate. So make sure you have all the operating people, the people necessary to do that. And record, record, record the data. I always recommend sending out a laminated sheet of your water system and which hydrants to go to at which times. So you go to hydrant number one, marked on the map, open it up, record how long it takes to get a good color, record what it takes when you do a turbidity, and record what happens when you start getting a free chlorine residual. I don't care what it is for a free chlorine residual, just until you get pink. So you can sit there with your little your, your little uh, hawk test kit, take a sample, shake it up, do I see pink? No. Do I see pink? I see pink, time's up. Record that. That will tell you if you're actually cleaning up your system or if your system continues to get dirtier and dirtier and dirtier over time. If it's getting dirtier, what's the use of this flushing? We gotta figure out what the problem is because we're doing the flushing, but it's getting dirtier. And a lot of times this happens so slowly over time. It's like your filter run times. Filter run times or amount of gallons through a filter can be, God, it hasn't changed much. It hasn't changed much in two years. Okay, let's let's look back and when the filter was first installed and take a look at it from that data point. That could be a big number, and usually it is a difference. So the more data you have, the more way of controlling it, the more way of recording it, the better. Systematic flush and make sure you use water the, the right way. One of the things you have going for you right now when you flush 
And in some municipalities and in some states, you're not going to like what I'm going to tell you, but in some cases they are requiring dechlorination during flushing. Why is that? Because that chlorinated water is what? Going into their riverways, their streams. So in some instances, in some municipalities, and I don't know if it will happen here in Minnesota, but they are having to put additional apparatuses on their hydrants so they can dechlorinate their chlorinated water. Just a requirement. General guidelines. Just, you know, closed valve. We all know how to flush hydrants. I hope. Fluorates. Those are some pretty high numbers. Those are the recommended flow rates for flushing different size mates. Pretty high numbers. You can deplenish, deplenish a water source real quickly, a tower real quickly, a clear well real quickly. If you have consecutive water systems, if you're selling water to somebody, if you sell water to a mobile home park, to a campground, whatever it may be, discuss your flushing program with them. Because it makes them very little sense to not flush during the same time you're flushing. Because you're removing all this stuff, you're kicking it up, and if they're not getting it out of their system, it's just accumulating. So always try to work with your whoever you're selling water to if, if, if there is somebody there. Perfect. Two minutes. Equipment checklist, dirty water, benefits of cleaning your distribution system, reduce DVPs, restore flow rates, a lot of different benefits. Most importantly, it helps extend infrastructure cost. So if you can extend the life of your infrastructure, you are on the, you're, you're ahead of the boat. Our responsibility again is the best that we can be, keep water safe that I can go in any drink. Oh. Any questions, comments? Go ahead. When you were, uh, I, I've heard about that, the uh, deformation of the uh, flushing water. But it, to me, it, unless you're discharging it directly into receiving water, to me it seems like the, the chlorine residual is going to be diminished really quickly as it's running on the ground uh, with all the everything on the ground. Just there's a lot of demand there. The, 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 the question was that he heard about the, the being able to have to dechlorinate your hydrant waste. And he said it, it doesn't make much sense to him that if he puts it on the ground, there's going to be a lot of use, a lot of usage before it actually gets into a water stream. I'd agree with that, except in certain cases where it's pavement or it's a clean street, it's it's not. It would not be what I would would rule if I was working on the EPA. But it's something that different municipalities do because at one time there's there's some instances of fish kills into like trout streams where they've seen that issue. So I, I'd agree with you on that. If you're testing for chlorine and stop your flushing, would you get a chlorine residual, then it would be a non-issue with it. it. It is, but you're still getting, you're getting some chlorine free. If you test it completely all the time and take samples, but what they're thinking is you're doing 800 gallon per minute, you got a lot going out there, even if you run a, a, a 50 second test. Any other questions, comments? Well, thank you very much for your time, and, and uh, good luck with the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.